Hello, I'm Tom Lehman, the designer of Raise Arcana, a new game that is premiering right now at the Cannes Game Festival, and it will be available in both uh, France and in the United States in the middle of March. Raise Arcana is a game where the <coughs> where the players play the role of alchemical mages and seeking to gain victory points by playing artifacts onto the table and then using them and the magical essences to gain more essences, ultimately to get these places of power or these monuments, which are the main sources of victory points. So once, uh, so that's the overall flow of the game. Uh, you're effectively racing the other players uh, to uh, acquire uh, these points. And if one player claims a place of power, then it's not available to me. So there's a lot of mm, who's going for what and can I wait to continue to build my essence pool or do I need to go claim something right away? In the game, there are preset hands for your very first game. And similarly, these are two-sided. We're using the preset sides right now, but in later games, for each one, you would determine it randomly which to use. Um, I'm not going to use a preset hand. Instead, I'll show you what would happen in the normal game. So you are dealt randomly eight artifacts out of a deck of 40, and you look at those artifacts. And some of the things you look at at the start of the game is, for example, do I have a way to make gold? Because the only way to place a monument is with gold. So if I look at my cards and I don't see any way to make gold, then it says I'm probably not going to do a monument strategy. Now, if there's a power missing on the cards, we have these magic items, like this item right here we can see has a power to make gold. So there are if you're missing something here, often the magic items will help fill it in. But I look at these cards, I don't see any way to make gold, but I start to notice that I have several cards in here that make death. And doing that, and here we have the catacombs of the dead over here, which enables me to take death and turn it into victory points. So I start to go, hmm, maybe that's the path I'm going to, to go down. I also notice that I have a creature. Artifacts can either be just an artifact, a creature, or a dragon, right? And with the dragon, that makes this dragon lair more interesting. And with the creatures, I notice I have two creatures. That makes this druid circle more interesting. So I go, hmm, okay, there are different ways I could go with this, but that I'm probably aiming for one of these three um, places of power. Having done that, I then shuffle up the cards, and I would uh, hand it to an opponent to cut, and then I draw the top three, and that is my initial hand. So I'll show you the cards that I have here and I look at those, and then I get my choice of two different mages. Uh, and that's after I've seen how everything is out there, and I've looked at my deck, and I've gotten my three-card hand. I look at that, and I go, well, this one you know, makes some uh, death essence every turn, and, but I don't see an easy source of life here to use this other power. So I'm going to keep this uh, scholar, this uh, over here, who is good at drawing cards. So that will be my mage, and my mage starts on the board. The other one goes away. These are my starting hand, and now every other player would do that. I'm going to say that I'm the first player, and in a uh, a three-player game, say, player three would pick one of these, and then maybe player two would pick another one of these, and then finally as the first player, this helps balance out the first player advantage, I would look at the remaining ones, and noticing that I probably need uh, either some death or life if I'm pursuing this path that I think I may be on, I'll take this potion. 
And now we actually start play. In a round, there are three steps to a round. The first step is the collect phase. And if you see this little hand symbol here that says, I can collect either one death or one life, my choice. So thinking that I'm going to try this death thing, I'll take this extra death. Uh, I don't have a collect symbol on the mage. If it had one, I'd also get something from there. All the other players do their collections. And then I, as the first player, start taking an action. During the action phase, we go round and round, each doing one action at a time until everyone has passed. The possible actions are play an artifact. So in this case, um, say I decided I wanted to play this dragon egg. The cost is up in this corner. It's one gold. And I would pay the gold and place it on the table. That's one possible action. Another action is to claim a place, a, a place of power. And as you can see, I don't have the resources to do, claim any of them at the moment. But if I did so, I would take it and put it in front of me, pay the resources. Similarly, if I had a bunch of gold, I could buy one of these monuments and put it in front of me. When, since all monuments cost four gold, I can buy either of the two that are face up, or I can buy the top one from the deck. Um, so that's uh, claiming a monument or a place of power from the center, playing an artifact from my hand. Those are two of the possible actions. A third action is to use a power. Here's an example of a power on my mage that I'm going to use. This power says, turn this mage, so I can only use it once unless some other power lets me straighten it, and pay any essence in order to draw one card. So this time I'm going to give up a fire essence and draw a card. Normally you only draw cards when you pass and you only draw one card. That's the only automatic drawing in the game. So powers that let you draw a card are quite useful. So I do that, and now I see that uh, uh, this card is a useful card. So on my next action, I play this Cursed Skull, and that lets me uh, cost me two death. I do that. So this has been used, and I have the two death here. And now I'll use its power, which is turn it, spend a life, to get any three that I want that are not gold or life. So I'm going to, in this death idea, collect three more death. And so that's another action. So that's the use a power action. Um, a third type of action, and this is probably the most important action, is to spend the card for essences. So I put the card in there and I can have any two essences. So knowing that this takes life, I'll take a life for next turn. And since I'm trying to collect death, I'll also take a death. Instead of these uh, two essences, I could take just one gold instead. Gold is very important in alchemy and it's a rare and harder to get resource. So I do that. And I look at my cards, and I think about it, and I decide I'm going to, I'm going to also do that here. So I'm rapidly building up a pile of death. And this card, it costs zero. So I can put it out for free. But that's not really for free because I could just spend it for two cards. Its ability is to turn it and get one of anything that isn't gold. So it won't pay off really until three rounds and the game is pretty short. Typically it's only four or five rounds. So I have to decide, do I think that getting more death right away is important or do I think that this is turn one, this is, will probably pay off. So I decide that I'll put it down on the table, and then I spend it, and I make another one. 
Now, if another player at the table were also collecting death, then I might really feel like I'm in competition, and I might just spend it for the two and say, good enough. All right? Now I've done that. I'm out of cards. I've used all my powers. So that's the other thing you do, which is to pass. The first player to pass claims this uh, token, which is a floating victory point. And that can create a lot of tension around passing as you get close to the end of the game, as this point may be the difference between crossing the 10 victory point threshold or not. Let's say that some other player has already passed. So when I pass, I don't get it anymore. And then I have to turn in my magic item and take one of the other items. Now, if the other player passed, they might have put this in and pulled this out. And then I go in, and that's another source of player interaction, because sometimes I want to pass early to get something that's sitting there, and sometimes I want to wait until someone turns in the one that I want in order to get it. So I'm going to take this one and, uh, as my item, and I place it face down. The other players would continue to do actions until they've passed. And it has a little reminder here that tells me to draw a card. So those are the three steps when you pass. If you're the first player, you take this token, uh, you then exchange your magic item, and then finally you draw a card. Then once all the players have passed, we check for victory. I have no victory points here. Uh, then you straighten up all your cards, and everyone else straightens up their cards. You flip over your items, and you're ready to do another round of play. So uh, now I'm in a position where I have these on the table. And next round, I might do the actions, for example. Spend this to draw a card. Yeah. Uh-huh. This is one of the cards I wanted to see. This is the Hand of Glory, which lets me tap for two uh, death. Uh, it cost me a death and a life, and I need a life there. So what I'll do is I'll play this, use this magical shard to make me a life, use that over here to make three more death, and then use this, uh, spending that life, for the three more death, and then spend this to make two more death and give one death to each of my opponents. Okay, and that's another form of player interaction where this one gives me more resources, but I'm also giving resources to my opponents. Then I can uh, invest and maybe even spend the gold, even though gold is hard to get, to get one more card. And now, I look at these, and I go, it's time to claim a place of power. So it's round two, and already I'm grabbing a place of power. It costs me nine death. So I do all that. And so how does a place of power work? Um, we look at it, it'll earn me one death a turn, and it's worth one victory point for every death on this component. And here, it, said it has two powers. The first power is for every five death, I can put a death on it, gain a victory point. And the second power is I can turn this and get a, a death on it from the, from the supply. Once I turn a component, I can't use powers anymore. So I, I look at that. And I go, well, if I'm really trying to accelerate, I could spend both of these cards for four more death and use that top power. But I'm going to hold on to these cards because that gives me some flexibility for next turn. I'll just tap, uh, turn this once, put a death on it, and then I pass. Hopefully during this time, someone has turned in this reanimation thing because that's really the item I want for next turn. So let's pretend that I've swapped that and I managed to time that correctly. And then I draw another card. Okay. 
So that's the flow of the game, and you can see that the actions are pretty straightforward. It's the chaining of the actions and deciding which cards are going to go on the table and which ones am I going to spend that are sort of the critical strategic decisions. Now at the end of this turn, at the end of this round, I have one victory point. We straighten everything up. And just to show you how this might work a little bit more, now I got one of the cards that, was, uh, that I had seen in my original deck that's very important. This is, uh, it has the ability to turn life into three death, right? So, I, but it costs a gold and I spent that gold last turn. So I'm going to burn this card for a gold spend these two, put this onto the table. Now I really need some life to run these powers. So I'm going to spend these, I'm going to spend the shard to make one life. And looking ahead, I'm going to also burn this card for, a, uh, for another two life so that I have them for next turn as well. Now I'm starting to make that push uh, towards victory. So I do this, get two death, give one to each of my opponents, do this, turn in a life, get three death, except this death is for the future. It's on this component. So it's sitting there uh, for next turn. Then over here, I spend this for three death. And then with five of them here, I use them to put one here. Then I spend this death to draw another card that forces the reshuffle of the deck. So I reshuffle, draw the card, and I'll burn that for a death, two deaths, say. And then here, I spend this, well, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I turn this to use that second power to put one here. Now I spend the reanimate to bring it back, spending one of anything. And now I turn it a second time. So I'm accelerating using this reanimate to accelerate my victory point engine. And now at the end of the round, I am up to four uh, victory points. And now I have more death coming in here, lots of power, and I might, depending if I'm able to pass early next round before anyone else pass, I might actually hit the 10 threshold on the next turn. Of course, everyone else has been doing what they're doing, claiming places of power and uh, possibly playing dragons to cause me to have to uh, defend myself with life. So that's a form of interaction that we should probably discuss a little bit. Let's pretend that this dragon had been placed by another player. What it says is they tap it and I have to discard two life or pay off the earth dragon with a single gold. Okay, there's sort of two things I can do to drive off this dragon. If I have to spend two life, and let's say I was in the middle of my turn in this sort of position, well, there's one life, and for every life I don't have to spend, I have to spend another two resources. So that can cause you know, some potential problems for me unless I have a defense. What's an example of a defense power? If I had this guard dog in front of me, we can see that it has a reaction power that says react to life loss, turn this guard dog and ignore it. So if a player did this in this situation, instead of having to lose those resources, I could instead just do this and say, go away, okay? So there's also interaction of this form where you inflict life loss on your opponent and there's defenses. Now, once a player has passed, they're immune to life loss. So that also affects this whole passing decision. Not only is it about the items I can get 
and the floating victory point, but maybe someone's threatening my resources. So there's a lot of things, and all of these interactions combine to say that while you know a lot and you can do a lot of planning, there's still a lot of tactical things so that you don't have the ability to construct a long, perfect plan over many turns and you know have people staring at the board for hours. That's not possible because you're constantly reacting to the fact that you may be getting resources from players. They may be placing a threat on the table like a dragon or uh, they may be turning in an item or passing before you. So there's a, a number of different player interactions in this game. And, but that, I think, should give you the flavor of Ray's Arcana. We really didn't go down the monument path in this example, but you could see that if I had some sort of gold engine, I could be investing in monuments, and that's three victory points. And the ones that have single powers, like this one, single victory points are quite nice in that they have a strong power. This produces a gold a turn. And uh, they range from one to three victory points. So that would be another path that a, another player could explore. And sometimes it's your backup uh, path where if one player grabs the place of power you were aiming for, you can sometimes convert over to a monument strategy. That's Ray's Arcana. I hope you try it out and Enjoy it. Thank you.